So thank you very much for, uh, I didn't know how many people would be here, so this is great. Um, really happy to be with you today to talk about simulations and learning, something that's very close to my heart and so something I've been involved with for, for quite some time now. Uh, actually, the, to, this month is the 20th anniversary of uh, starting this company, so it's gone by pretty quickly. So as I mentioned earlier, this is... Uh, seemed like an apropos picture to use. This is our uh, e-learning product manager sitting in a flight simulator for uh, an F-35. And, um, you know, I think you're probably all somewhat familiar with that metaphor of using a flight simulator to train pilots. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. What I would like to do is extend that thinking uh, uh, to the field of practice that we're all engaged in. So here's today's trip. I'm going to talk just briefly about the problem that we all face in trying to, to, to build capability. And I really hate to talk about training. I really want to talk about capability. Um, why it matters, why effectiveness of that training or build, building of capability really matters. <coughs> what's, what, what's the path to mastery? The, then get in a little bit more into the meat of the role of simulation and some best practices, things that we've learned over the years. The, uh, my comments are going to be really based on my experience or the company's experience helping these companies and others to, to uh, accomplish some pretty, pretty uh, complicated uh, objectives, of trying to train problem solvers to be effective in you know, what, what are often Times some pretty difficult circumstances. So, so this is the context of my, my comments today. I want to tell you right up front, this is not going to be a sales pitch. So um, I want to talk about simulation generically. So I want to put you at ease that I'm not, you know, you're not somehow stumbled into an hour-long sales pitch that you can't easily get out of. But um, I know that there are some of you here, like I see um, Becky Box here from Ernst & Young, who has a lot of experience with simulations. Danny D. Rosario in the back from Lockheed Martin has experience with simulations. Cindy, uh, Constellation. So I've, we've, there's some folks here. I'm going to encourage all of you, because I think to varying degrees, a lot of you have, have experience with using simulations for, for training. I'd like this to be more of a conversation, less just me talking. So I'm going to invite at any point in time, if you've got a question or something to add, something to say, then let's, let's have uh, more of a conversation, OK? Everybody cool with that? Anybody have anything they want to add right at the get-go? All right, so you know, here's the problem that we're, we're kind of facing. We're trying to develop problem solvers. Has anybody ever seen this? I, I don't know if it's still sold. I have one on a shelf that someone gave me some years ago. This, this uh, they didn't quite get it right, but it's pretty close. Okay, the the GI Joe Sigma Six. So this is this is kind of what we're faced with. We've got to develop people that are pretty capable of jumping into any situation and, and solving you know, whatever's in front of them, right? And so they have to be able to wield these weapons statistical weapons or whatever, but also they need a lot of, a lot of skill with, with the, the softer elements of convincing people to do things they don't want to do and all that, right? So it's a pretty tough challenge if you think about the, trying to engage both sides of um, people's brains in order, in order for them to be effective. And that really informs the, the training model, I think. So we like to think about capability, not just the ability to do something. Okay, you, you know, ASQ, you're, we're in an ASQ conference, so it's very common to think about a body of knowledge, right? The, the Lean Six Sigma Green Belt body of knowledge or the Black Belt body of knowledge. And that's useful, but it kind of misses a little bit, I think, the real problem, which is capability which is not just the body of knowledge. It's the body of knowledge plus the confidence to actually go use it. And isn't that where a lot of times we, f we find people 
just not quite engaging, you know, new, new black belts, new green belts who have, have mastered a lot of techniques, there's a lot of analytical techniques, but maybe are a little unsure about, well, okay, well, what do I do next? Anybody ever face this? The what do I do next problem? I know how to use this tool. It's like if you taught me to learn to play the piano and I learned notes, right? And I, all, I had, can play all these individual notes, but that's not a song. You gotta be able to connect the notes and that's always the hard part is what, how does one thing flow into another? So let's, let's um, use that framework for all this discussion today is about building capability and that's confidence as well as, as uh, skills. All right, so I think it's important to stop for a second and just consider the importance of effectiveness. Now, in my experience, nobody does a very good job of measuring this. Now, that, that may be an exception in this room. Is there any of your, do any of your organizations do a really good job of measuring the effectiveness of your training, do you think? It's really hard, isn't it? Because what's the most important indicator of effectiveness? Is what, project? The, doing the project work that you train people to do in the first place? And how separated is that project work from the training activity in time and space? Like, weighed, weight, waste, it's, it's, a, it's a lagging indicator, so it's really hard. But just stop and think about, I just threw some numbers up here. Let's say you're a medium-sized company and you're doing 100 <laughs> projects a year and it's worth seven and a half million dollars. Well, gee, if you have a 30%, and I'll come back to that number, but if you had a, let's say you have a 30% effectiveness uh, premium, maybe that's 30% more projects, maybe it's they get done 30% faster, maybe it's their 30% more benefits, you know, it ends up being a whole lot of money. The premium in effectiveness is probably enough to pay for your whole program. If it's a big company, then the numbers are even more astounding. So. Effectiveness really, really matters, and all too often it's not the driver in the design of the learning model. So, okay, so let's describe our operating environment. Anybody? Well, how, well, how would you characterize your operating environment for process improvement? What's true about it? How would you, how would you describe it? One element. Is it super simple? Okay, are there hard, so it's difficult? Very difficult. Can anybody, do I, I hear, I got a very difficult, do I, anyone want to raise me? <laughs> the, the products that we manufacture don't take minutes or seconds, they take months or years. Okay, long lead times, a lot of complexity with that. So probably no politics in that environment either, right? Any silos? Ever any silos? Messiness? Does any learning gaps? So lots of different baselines that people come. Does anything changing ever in your environment while you're doing process improvement work, or is it pretty much all static? Right? So, you know, this is our world, right? It is messy. It's super complicated. It's really hard. It's sometimes dangerous. I mean, literally sometimes physically dangerous, but certainly at least politically dangerous, right? So that's what we're trying to prepare people to operate in. Now, think about a complex skill that you have mastered, everybody. Think about something that's complicated, complex, that you've learned how to you know, playing a musical instrument, some athletic skill, some, some analytical skill, something, okay, got it? All right, now, what activity was most effective in helping you develop that skill? Repetition, practice, what else? Co a coach? Coach? Failing, learning by failing, wow, isn't that true? Exceptional colleagues, all right? 10,000 hours, visuals, 
teamwork. Okay. So nobody said a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> why, why is it you, you don't develop complex skills by looking at PowerPoints? Think about that. How many of you use lots of PowerPoints in your training? Okay, now, it's fair to say that there's a lot of foundational knowledge that you can convey with a slide, kind of like this. But just park that thought, okay, and we'll kind of come back to it. So any USC fans here? Okay, the, 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 I'm talking about the other USC. Okay, good, safe. Usually we pick on Michigan because I'm from Columbus, Ohio, but you know, that's not as much fun anymore. It's just kind of like. Um, anyway, a typical college football team. This is just my back of the envelope calculations. All right, 13 games, 60 minutes of clock time. It's 13 hours, but if you're on offense or defense, you're only doing half, you're only playing half the time, right? So it's half of that, if you're in on every play. Now, during the season, team practices something like 380 hours-ish. Again, my back of the envelope calculation. So that is a practice to performing ratio of 58 to one. Now, what is your practice to performing ratio? in building capability of your people. Anybody? One to one? Yeah, I remember my first job as a supervisor on the assembly line at Ford Motor Company. It was less than one to one for sure. <laughs> Here's the keys to your, to your cabinet. Go, go get it. Right? Trial by fire. Probably not 58 to one, right? So, why is it not higher? I mean, to some extent, most of us have a, a somewhat of an apprenticeship model, perhaps, right? Where the, the initial performing is maybe under the tutelage of a master of some sort. So there's some help, right? So first project or first work that maybe is sort of practice or sort of not performing. Not, so you're not on the high wire on your own with no, you know, with no net. But really, it's kind of a stark comparison. You know, th think about this kind of situation. I, has anyone ever seen this guy speak? Sullenberger, Sol Sol is that his name? Sully? I saw him a couple years ago. He's really interesting, right? So think about s trying to do something like this if you had never been in a, you know, in a simulator flight simulator and experienced extreme kinds of situations that you can't, you know, you're not going to, hopefully you don't ever do two of those in your life, right? And, you know, back to the, to the PowerPoint discussion, I mean, there is a certain amount of foundational knowledge that's necessary for a pilot, even before getting into a flight simulator and perhaps practicing landing on water, there's a lot that you need to, to learn before that. So there's a foundation of knowledge that needs to be built, but who would be comfortable getting in an airplane if the pilot were only trained in this setting? Not me, but yet a lot of our people are put into situations where we're asking them to perform, fly the airplane, don't crash it, Okay, because it's, there's, it's, it, there's a lot of money at stake and there's a lot of careers at stake and the business depends on your, on your success, but we put them in a situation where they need to perform with only this. You know, who, you said, Cindy, you said failure, learning by failure. Don't, what's the value of creating a safe space so that people can fail and learn by failing? And so that when they're put in a situation where they need to perform, the results are a lot more predictable. Okay, so now I want to get into simulation and talk about simulation a little bit more. This is my definition. Sequence of activities with inputs and outputs that, where the dynamics resemble real life in some, to some extent. 
Who would, would anybody add to that or amend it? Does it, does it look good, not make sense? Now let's think about the hierarchy of learning, what we're trying to accomplish with, with people. I mean, where's project work? It's up here, evaluating and creating. So this is Bloom's taxonomy. Now certainly you gotta remember certain things. You gotta understand some facts, basic facts, but we're really trying to push people up this hierarchy, aren't we? Because they're doing pretty complicated work. And I would argue that if we're going to push them up this hierarchy, that we've got to also change their learning, learning activities. That we're not going to teach them to do things that are complicated by having them practice things that are super simple. So we've got to move from structured, simple, linear, close-ended kinds of activities to things that are messy. So if we're going to expect them to do messy work successfully, don't we have to give them some practice doing messy work? Yes? You know, you can kind of break it down if you're looking at a learning model, and we'll, we'll, I'm going to get into this in a little bit more detail, but so there's a lot of foundational work that needs to be done. Simulations really, I think, come in, really come into play as we get into the higher order, connecting the dots, the space between the notes, the what do I do next, and then actual project work and coaching is the messiest of all. It's the least structured. All right, so let's think about simulations using these four dimensions, okay? So open-endedness, first of all. Really important thing to consider. So open-endedness would just be, so if I want to walk from here downstairs, like I can go a bunch of different ways, right? It's open-ended. I can take almost any path I want to. It's not discrete, other than where the stairs are, right? So open-endedness is like most of real life where you are not typically presented with multiple choice answers. Okay, difficulty, how hard is it? Straightforward enough. Fidelity means how close to the real world is the simulation. An abstracted kind of simulation can be useful. So in you, you probably use simulations in your training where you use playing cards or dice, right? Or things like that that are an abstraction. If you've ever seen a quincunix that you use to simulate uh, like central limit theorem, okay? It's an abstraction, but nobody runs a quincunix as part of their business, right? So it's has a very low, f it's, it's useful, it's interesting, but it's very low fidelity. And then scoring, which is a whole nother thing, and is what turns simulations into games. So scoring is kind of an interesting thing to think about, because we're all, who's not, is anybody here that's not competitive at all? Likes to lose, who likes to lose? Doesn't care, see, we all like to win. So games are activities, rules, and scoring. So a simulation with some rules and scoring, <coughs> now all of a sudden, this is kind of interesting to think about because this gets a lot of juices flowing, right? Do you agree? See this happen? All right, so open-endedness means from wherever you start, you can go in lots of different paths. So as we think about simulations, we ought to consider open-endedness. Now, the, it's higher fidelity, but what are some problems with open-endedness? Have, have any of you ever run like a lean simulation where you go through several iterations, uh, like tabletop simulations, okay? So what's true of those? What have you seen? Is there a dark side to this? Has anybody ever seen that? Focus? What happens when you give people unbounded creativity? Yeah, they're kind of unbounded, aren't they? They're un they, I mean, they can do, so you may have a certain learning objective that you want to accomplish, and when you have lots of, lots of possible pathways, people may choose pathways that you didn't intend that don't end up reinforcing your original learning objective. So usually those lean simulations have some constraints that are added to this to make sure that your learning objectives are achieved. Like between iterations of improvements, you can only make two improvements. 
or three. And they have to be approved by management or something like that. So you can make sure that you kind of keep people on track. Norbert, you've seen this, haven't you? You run Lean Sims? Yeah, I've seen uh, a simulation once that went over a whole week. Uh-huh. Um, I don't think uh, that 50% is the audience in the last week. Yeah. So the long... Right. So the longer they last, the more dangerous this is because you can get really off track. And then, you know, if it's a choose your own adventure, but it's any adventure, it may not be, you know, may not be that productive. And then this would be a close ended kind of architecture, which is discrete. So there are discrete choices. Right. So the benefit would be you can map it out and you can control where people are going to go. What's the downside? Anyone? Okay. Other things that you haven't been contemplated? Does this, what's the fidelity of this relative to the real world? It's also hard to keep your coaching job. Right, right. So I would argue that, this, that the real world doesn't really follow this. I mean, you just don't, no one, yeah, I mean, when you get into a project, you're in the measure phase, and there's not a magical list of things that appears that you might do next. Right? You have to come up with them. It's not discrete. But the benefit is, this is really a lot easier to program. So if you're using any kind of technology to support your simulation, this is a whole lot easier to program. Now, I want to come back to this and talk about how we can integrate the two. All right, so let's look at this simulation. Let's evaluate this in terms of open-endedness, fidelity, difficulty, scoring. So is how open-ended is this? For the person in the back. <laughs> Not very, is it? All right, you are following wherever I go. Okay, that's intentional. Okay, how, what's, how, what's the fidelity? I mean, it is a bike. It's like being on a bike, but you don't really have to, if you're the little, little person on the back, you don't really, you're, just, you're there, but you're not doing it all. You're doing a little bit of it, right? But you're not really needing the balance that's being taken care of. Hopefully, hopefully this is a reliable pilot, right? Difficulty, not that difficult, just got to pedal or not, if, right? You know, and there's no score. Now, here's another simulation. What do you think about this one? Higher fidelity, huh? Limited a little bit, some constraints, but pretty high fidelity. What about open-endedness? Go wherever you want. A little more difficult? You can tip those over. I've done that. <laughs> okay. No, again, no scoring. It's not really a game. But, you know, we can apply the same thinking as we look at our learning activities and the simulations, um, large and small, that we put people through. You know, so in a perfect world, like the, like the first example of the bike, um, we'd all have, as we're trying to learn something, we would have this coach that, right, that's right there with us. Well, that would be great, wouldn't it? Learning, learning by doing, learning by failing, constant feedback, immediate feedback from someone who really knows how to wash cars, okay? But is that the reality of your world? Who can afford this model? Anybody? Not really. It's not very scalable. So we've got to come up with other solutions. We've got to find other ways to provide. Um, so let's think about looking at act simulation activities with a couple of, um, on a couple of dimensions, open-endedness and complexity. OK, so here's project work. How am I doing for time, by the way? 
time is it? Okay, we got lots of time to talk. Okay, so here's our project work. The question is, where's our learning activities? You know, our project work is very complex and it's very open-ended. We're trying to move in that direction, right? You know, here's a bunch of simulations. Now, let, let me back up and ask you, the things that you've done, where do they fall in this, on this map? Okay, who uses activities? Give me an activity that you use. Anything. Card drop, you use a card drop? Where's card drop? What do you think? It's open-ended, right? They can fall anywhere? And it's simple. So it's up here? Okay. What else? Anybody use multiple choice questions in their training? So where are they? They're close ended by definition, right? And they might be simple, or they might be complex, but they're somewhere in here. Maybe a range. So maybe they're a story problem with, that's kind of complex that has data that you have to download, or maybe it's just a simple, what does the D in Demaic stand for? Which is here. Maybe that's, maybe that's useful, foundational. Maybe we've got to reinforce some basic stuff before we move to the complex. What else? What about these, what about lean, who does a tabletop lean simulation? So you do that. Who else? Okay, where does that fall? Uh, it's probably right in the middle because it's a factory simulation. Okay. You're constraining it a little bit, yeah. right? Well, it's halfway between yeah. those and open-ended. Yeah. There are choices they can make mm -hmm. as long as they don't get outside of your boundaries. Okay, so if, you let, if it was less constrained, it might be more, more open-ended, right. but maybe, to not, maybe not to good effect. Okay, everybody agree with that? What else? What else does anybody else do? Yes? Okay. Yeah, so where, how would you, where would you put that? That's um, kind of an interesting one to score, it's isn't it? The, like, we buy the Oreos off the shelf, so to some yeah. extent. Yeah, who knows what's going to happen with all that. Right. Um, but not too open-ended. But it's gauge R. You're, you're doing the attribute agreement analysis. We're doing gauge R. You're, doing, you're actually measuring variable. We do an attribute agreement analysis with them. Okay. Yeah, the other, okay. <laughs> I can tell where your thinking is. Um, all right, so you know it's so the gauge R and R is pretty complicated, right. and it's but it's not totally open ended because they follow they're kind of following a script when they do it, a sort of. Yeah, so maybe in here somewhere. Yeah. Anybody else? Oh, catapults. Yeah, classic the statapult. So where would you put that? It's pretty complicated. You could do a lot with it. It's pretty complicated. Um, how open-ended is it? It's not really, is it? Because you only have the factors are predefined, and the levels are all, you know. So it's kind of here, right? Because you're not really wading into an unknown situation and trying to figure out what the factors are. They're kind of in front of you, and and they're they're discrete. Discrete number. Anybody else got any, any any other simulations? That's pretty good. Lego. Okay, so kind of a lean simulation. Where would you put that, Bill? You know, it's you again. You're kind of constraining them. So maybe in here, in the middle somewhere. Yeah. So, so. Um, let me, I'm going to show you a couple of other simulations, and we'll, let's, rate, let's kind of rank them just to think about some other possibilities. So let me just get into a browser real quick. All right, so let's look at a, I'm just going to do a simple little, sim you can help me rate this. So this is a 5S simulation. Skip through this. This is like a pit crew, okay? 
So we're going to do the first couple phases of, so this is timed. So my, I got to find this stuff in order. Move it over here. Okay. So I got a bucket. I got this thing. I got. wheel. And if I drag the wrong wrench, you know, it's got to be the right orientation. And then, okay. So I got a time, 33.9 seconds. Right. So now, next phase is I'm going to get rid of the stuff I don't need. Classic 5S move, right? Sort it out. Let's just deal with the stuff we actually need. Anybody have any pit crew experience here? That's pit, that's, that applies. All right. So I improved my score by 48%. Now, what if I put everything in place? Right? <coughs> so now I've, I'm eliminating walk time by putting things where I need them. This will just take one more few seconds. All right, so that's that sim. All right, so how would you score that? What is that? It's kind of close, but is it? Like, it is, but then I have a lot of control over what I do next, and I, you know, the, where I put things is, so it's mostly closed, but it's a little open-ended just in how I approach it and the, the sequence and, you know, how I move things around, what I choose to do. Um, it's not that complicated, is it? It's pretty simple. I mean, could you put them in different orders? No, no, not in this, not in this, not in this case. So this is a simple, pretty simple, fairly close-ended, right? But <laughs> also really fast. All right, let's look at another, let's look at, Let's look at a, um, just as a simple drag and drop kind of, this is a hotel, okay, we're looking at y as a function of x, which of these things might be an x that would affect checkout time, okay? So staff training, yes? Per perception of room cleanliness, no, that happens after. Okay, credit card approval processing, yeah. Reservation system, yeah. Housekeeping room turnaround, probably. All right, so again, that was discreet, pretty discreet, pretty simple, okay. Now, I'm not gonna take you through anything that's long and complicated, because it would be long and complicated, right? It would take us a long time. But here's my point. Do you ever map out your activities? This is taking just a second. Make the jump to light speed. Do you ever map out your activities to consider how much of this landscape you're actually covering, right? If you're trying to move people up here, and you know you got to do foundational work. They got to learn the, the basics. Like, how do you fill in this space practice wise so that when they're doing their project work, they've done things that are complicated and they've done things that are open ended. And hopefully, they've done some things that are complex and open ended. So, it's a, just a model that you can use to kind of map out your actual learning activities. Because if all your learning activities happen here, if you're doing multiple choice quizzes to try to prepare people to do project work in the real world, where I go to you and ask you to help me collect some data, and you say, what? I'm sorry, I have other plans, <laughs> right? Or whatever. And I've got to try to convince you that collecting data for me would be really exciting and career fulfilling for you. You know, where does that show up on a multiple choice kind of preparation for, for the, you know, the kind of messy human-centered work that we're trying to prepare people to do? Okay. 
Um, so another, uh, another angle on this that I think is really interesting that we're trying to explore is using process models, so simulations of a process, not a learning simulation that is designed as a learning activity, but a simulation of a process as a way, to, you know, I, back to the fidelity thing, so high fidelity way to introduce process improvement thinking might be to build a model of an actual process within the business to be able to then play those so this is a little bit bit of an, a little bit of an abstraction but to be able to play those what if scenarios so back to this failing learning by failing like what would happen if i reduce setup time in this process what does that mean What's that, what, is that, what's that, what does that yield? What does that, what does that give us? What would happen if I improve quality performance and have less rejects that get cycled around? Or what would happen if we have more people involved or less, less resources, more resources? So I think this is gonna be kind of an, emer I, I'm really interested in this as an emerging area of, um, you know, back to this model where coaching really is one of those activities that is closest to project work. Right, that actual working with a coach, working with in an apprenticeship kind of model, and that this coaching based on simulations may be a, an interesting way of accomplishing that. Any thoughts? Anybody ever do that? Right. I want to set a scenario with a business problem that they then have to solve using a Lean Six Sigma tool. Right. Great. And that gives them, if they apply that, that gives them the outcome to move to the next step. Right. So, so in your way of, so go back to that 5S. That's, now, that's kind of a simple example, that simulation, right? But that is a step, that is a tool simulation, right? That is how do I use this tool to solve a problem kind of, so I agree with you completely. That's like the catapult, okay? It is a simulation of a particular tool to do a design experiment, all right? And that's really useful and it's sort of foundational. It's one of those notes that you learn to play on the piano. The next step, however, is how do I know when I should even do a designed experiment? When, how do I know that that would be the best course of action? And what kind of experiment ought, ought I run? And how do I think about this as a series of experiments? And do I do a screening experiment and then do other experiments? And so I think I agree with you completely, but then there's that next piece of how do I get to that, how do I recognize a situation of using that tool in the first place? One. Then, when I get the outcome from that, from that tool, what do I do? What do I do next? So like that's the kind of the messy front end and back end to that, I think. Well, that's, yeah, that's how you tie that together. Tying it together. Over right. So does anybody struggle with the, the messy part of, you know, what do I do with it? No? Simple? People just do that automatically? Becky, do they? Mm -hmm. in the classroom under the protective care of 
And then you have that debrief, right? That what were you thinking? Oh my God, what were you thinking? But <laughs> what were you doing? Why did you do that? What was, your pa- what was your plan? What was your strategy? Why did you do what you did? What worked for you? What didn't work for you? And, and, and that, that's really the heart of it, isn't it? Yeah. Think about your project. Think about going back to your day job tomorrow. How do you apply that? And can somebody flip the switch and give us an example of what they're going to do differently tomorrow as a result of doing this today? So do you think they build confidence by having been through some cycles of trying it and seeing? Most definitely. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a confidence builder, um, but it's also, having, it's also community building at the same time. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm really glad you said that, okay, because those of you that run simulations of any sort, I, my observation is when you do that kind of thing in a class, I, Bill, you can wade in on this, you, you know, part of building belts is building networks, <coughs> helping them build a fabric of relationships. And when you do those kind of activities where there is a joint struggle, I would maintain that you build a lot stronger relationships than if people are just listening to a presentation about how to do hypothesis testing or whatever. Right? Bill, what do you think? Okay, so you're trying to set the context first of Right. I do a lot of simulations for people to do. And they work very, very effectively for that. I mean, why if they know what it's about, then they behave in a totally different way. I have directors totally screw up. Then they, they would have how to play the game. Yeah, right. So that's the danger of scoring things is that people really, like, I think we established that we all like to win, right? So when you have games and people like to win, then sometimes it can lead, you've got to tamp that down a little bit sometimes. Like, people really like to win. So sometimes they get hung up on gaming the game and trying to win rather than the whole objective, which is to learn. So it's, you know, it's a dark, there's a dark side to that. And, and the more senior the people are involved in the simulation, they, they, they do. Because they've gotten away, they've learned that they can get away with it. I can't believe she said that. Can you? Only at her company. <laughs> yeah. Anything else on that subject? I think it's, so I was showing you the model earlier about open-endedness and closed-endedness. So, the, 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 so building on, that, on that, or the, that point that Becky made, I think, you know, whatever your activity is, even if it's a close-ended activity, you can use the context of your simulation to introduce other messier practice. So if I was using, like, let's just say, I've got a, I built a model of a process at a large, um, a large tax advisory company, for example. And I wanted to use this to, but we're really working on change management, right? So we could talk about what we're going to do to reduce a number of approvals in something like a, like let's say travel expense. Um, You know, that's a common thing. But just use that as, as an example. Well, 
if I were wanted to work on change management, we might use that context and then ask the question, all right, you know, we're going to role play. So Justin, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be the, the belt. I'm going to be the senior manager. I don't really want to change anything. You're going to have to convince me why we should change this process. So you can introduce, using the context of a simulation, lots of messy people-oriented, change management, team leadership, other stuff, but use the context of the simulation. So even if it's, close, even if it's a close-ended simulation, you can still make it your own by adding other stuff to it. Does that make sense? Has anybody ever done that? Do you do that around any of your lean sims? Kind of, probably. Where you, depending on the group, you might want to talk more about leader standard work and have them do lead, build their own leader standard work or build a huddle board for manage the process or something that's very open-ended. Okay. So how's this all come together? I'll show you one example. This is kind of how we think about blended learning using simulations as part of a model. Lots of different ways you could do this. This is just one, just to give you one construct. Think about the layers of, maybe in our world, it's all, there's, there's e-learning. There's some system support, some analytics that kind of drive everything, that tell you what's going on so you can manage the process. Some series of, in, our, in this model, study halls or group, think of it as group coaching events. Okay, and then some workshop that is, in this model, it's a capstone kind of, okay, you've learned all these individual tools, You've done simulations around individual tools. Now let's do something that's higher fidelity that puts it all together where I've got to figure out what to do next. Some maybe that's a game. Then there's project work at some point, which is the whole point of this in the first place. Maybe they're not starting till they're done with the training. Maybe they're starting earlier. And hopefully there's some one-on-one -on -one coaching in this model. So a bit of an impression. So where's simulation come into play? Well, it's really kind of three places. So tool practice simulation, the catapult, the, you know, things like that 5S. So you can do, as part of foundational training, do tool simulations. Then, as part of group coaching events, you could do process model simulations. So let's look at a process in our own company and see how these lean dynamics play out. Let's examine what might happen if we were to reduce setup times or if we move a queue from here to there or whatever. And then perhaps, um, and I think this is the most powerful, is the pulling it all together. The thing that's more like the flight simulator. So you gotta do something to put your new pilots in a flight simulator before you put them in the pilot seat. Does that make sense? Some of you have some experience with this. Okay. Anybody want to wade in? Well, our uh, training was kind of built around the simulation, but like you said, the simulation pulls everything together. Yeah. So we teach a little bit tools and come back to it. And, and we start off the class pretty much at the beginning with the first round of simulation. Everything is horrible. Yeah. And then you teach a little bit, you come back to it, they fix some things, and new problems arise. So it's sort of like Norbert, you introduce them to chaos. And then as they learn things, they rein it in. Yeah. They see how it all comes together in the end. So I took the activities of that model and I just mapped them out on that same grid that we were looking at before just to see, like, where's the time spent? You know, how much time is spent open ended? How much time is spent on simple close ended foundational stuff? And then you know, really the question is, are we spending enough time here? You, these things are usually quick anyway. They don't take much time to do something that is, you know, s simple. But are we spending enough time here? So that's what I would encourage you to kind of map out your learning activities and just ask yourself, are we doing enough that's in this quadrant that's closer to our project work? You know? Some data from, just, this is from our clients. This is relatively small sample size of 29, but, and really probably very messy because this measure of effectiveness varies from, client, from, from firm to firm. But just a question, how much 
Does this blended model work? How well does it work compared to whatever you're doing before, which is classroom training? You know, that's that 30% number that I referenced earlier. Maybe it's not 30, maybe it's 25, maybe it's 40. But whatever it is, it's worth a lot. So using simulation as part of your learning model is going to pay for itself, okay, whatever you do. And this is a chart. This is kind of a nice way of measuring confidence. I don't know if you do this. It's just so before when you start a class, you know, you put up a, just put some posts, up some big sheets on the wall and ask the class about their confidence level on a couple of different dimensions. So ask them, what's your confidence leading a project? And have them put, a, each person put a dot plot for wherever they are. And then at the end of class, have them do it again. Not super scientific, okay? Certainly it introduces some bias because it's self-scoring and they, you know, they want to show improvement. So probably they push the numbers to the right a little bit. But it is kind of interesting. And it's always revealing to the class when they look at what their collective confidence was before and what their confidence is after. It's kind of a nice, it's a lot more meaningful than did you like this training? Which, if you don't know, has zero correlation with how well it works. Like none, zero, okay? Not that it's not important. People should, all things being equal, give them, we should try to give them a good experience, but confidence is what really matters. Okay, so just summing up, practice matters a lot, okay? This is, you, this is the kind of work that you can't learn without doing. You can't watch this kind of work. You gotta be a, it's, it's a contact sport. You gotta get the practice gear on. The space between the notes and the real world is not multiple choice. So simulation in all of our research, simulation is the one thing in a learning model that drives results, it, it drives effectiveness. It, dri it drives stickiness, you know. I will mention that those of you who have run simulations would probably, I, I think, would agree that you need a commercial driver's license for that. Like, you can't just walk in to class and try to lead, I mean, depending, they vary, some of them, but you need to have some, some practice, some skill with the facilitating a simulation or you can get really kind of hung up. So I'll just, I always put that in there as kind of a cautionary tale that if you're going to have your people doing simulation driven work, you're, I think, nodding your head of you. Yeah. I mean, it can, it can be, yeah, it can be, yeah, it can be a real mess. So you just have to be prepared. Okay. Um, here's a, if you want to look at any simulations, this is a link that'll be up for a few days. It's just moresteam.com simulations.cfm. Um, you can look at several simulations. If you just want to play around and just see some examples, then that'll be up through the balance of the week. If you need that, come and see me. If you want to talk about simulations, I love to talk about simulations. I'll be here for the next couple days. You know, stop by. I'd love to hear what you're doing. I would really like to hear learn from your experiences. I'd like to know about what you wish you had that you don't have, um, which helps us think about what we ought to build. Okay, so any of that would be great if you have the time to stop and say hello. If I can help you in any way, I'm not going to try to sell you a bunch of stuff, but I would love to, have, I would love to see you have a better learning model. So I'd be happy to talk to you about what you're doing and what you might consider. Okay, that's it. Anybody got anything else? Anybody hungry? Yes. Not in one place that I'm aware of, but I can point you to some things that are uh, that are kind of open source that are out there if you want to. You know, if I th if I thought, think about it a little bit, you know, I was we. <laughs> this is just a. a sort of funny, sort of tragic story. I was thinking about ways of teaching FMEA, and, I w and we have some instructor stuff that we put together, and I was using the steam-powered rocket, the, and the guy died. I know, and I, I can't use it anymore, because he, like, I know, we were gonna do an FMEA of all the things that could go wrong, and I didn't know he was 
still in the business, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you.